Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us. Quaker Oats, it's the right thing to do. A hug, a kiss, and a good hot Quaker Oats breakfast. The best school day start you can give your youngster. For just as his soul is nourished by a hug and a kiss, so will his young body be nourished by a good hot breakfast of Quaker Oats. Yeah, that's right. That's how most of us grew up. Quaker Oats in any, we called it hot cereal, oatmeal, whatever you want to call it. It was the way to start breakfast that sticks to your ribs and keeps you going until dinner. That's what we were told. And that's what the wonderful actor and activist Walter Brimley told us in his Quaker Oats ads. Oats. Pure, 100% natural, whole grain oats. Hot Quaker oatmeal at breakfast is a good, wholesome choice. Can really help you get through the morning. Quaker Oats. It's the right thing to do. Little did he know, little did most of us know, but it seems our beloved oats are full of glyphosate. Found in Roundup, and according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, glyphosate is probably cancer-causing. The Environmental Working Group published a study the other day, on August the 15th, called Breakfast with a Dose of Roundup. The woman who wrote that piece is a toxicologist. Her name is Dr. Alexis Temkin, uh, and she's been an investigative scientist for a long time. She's on their team at the Environmental Working Group. And Alexis, welcome, good to have you with us. Thanks a lot, happy to be here. So what a way to ruin the day. <laughs> Starting out with our breakfast and being told that, that, that this potential glyphosate, this, this potential cancer-causing agent is in our food. So take a step backwards for us um, and talk about the complexity of this research, how it began and, and, and how you began your research. Sure. So as you know, in 2015, glyphosate was classified as a probable hallucinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Since then, there's been um, some reports of glyphosate detected in grains like wheat and oats. And some of that came from the FDA, and some of that has come from other independent scientists and independent reports. So EWG really wanted to set out and do an exploratory set of samples for oat breakfast products to see what glyphosate looks like in those products. For I think many people who <clears throat> will read the article and hear this news, um, the, people get very confused about this. So this, this is a chemical found in Monsanto, in Monsanto's ra Roundup, uh, historically used uh, with their own other products. So, but this is a little different because what we're saying here, this is being used on fields of oats and barley and more to, to make the crop turn faster so they can harvest it and, and it, get it to the public. And that's where the problem begins, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's a use of glyphosate that's called pre-harvest application. And so you're using glyphosate late in the season, right before harvest, which can lead to high levels of glyphosate in the grains that are then used for the processed foods. The science, because I mean, when again, when you read the story, if you don't know science, if you don't uh, get into what it means to have a problem of 10 parts per 100,000, whatever that means for most people, which means nothing for most people when they read it. What does it have to do with the growth of cancer in human beings and how that affects us? Sure. So when you set standards for levels of uh, probable carcinogen in food, you look at the risk and especially the risk to vulnerable populations. In this case, we're concerned about children. So EWG worked to develop a standard that's scientifically based to be more health protective for the vulnerable population, which is children. We used an estimate of people eating roughly two cups of cereals a day to get to our health benchmark of 160 parts per billion. And what we're really concerned about is lifetime exposure and long-term exposure and what those health effects are going to be. I mean, part of me, what I've read in interviews I've done before, is that part of the issue, it seems, is it a great deal of research about why there's such a rise in cancer uh, in the world may have to do with environmental factors and things that we eat. But that's where it seems like where most of the research money is not when it comes to trying to find out what the roots of cancer are. So, and how, so how do we know, how can we be for certain that this actually is part of it? I mean, I know that it's, it was called in some of the international agencies as a probable cause. Could you flesh that out for us? Sure. So in that classification, there's considerable strong evidence in animal studies and also evidence from epidemiological studies to make that classification. 
So with those data, you can develop risk-based levels that are more are protective for human health and specifically focus on children. And are there studies that can, can show that in greater depth? It's really hard to look at glyphosate exposure in the general population. There's not great biomonitoring. That's something that needs to be done to be able to really do those studies. So one of the things that really struck me as I read your article um, is that Monsanto that was taken to court uh, in the finding, I think it was, was a 289 million dollar settlement with a person who had cancer uh, for their exposure to the chemicals in Monsanto's products. One of the things in the report that said that um, that Monsanto was intentionally hiding facts from the public, much like the tobacco companies that were sued in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and as I, so, and what do we know about that? And how is that related to or not related to the fact that the FDA seems to be sitting on some of the research itself? There are a couple of reports um, that some of the EPA data, for instance, that they use to set their guidelines can be influenced by some of the work that was done by Monsanto. They are known for what's called ghostwriting, where some of the data they were producing to claim that glyphosate was safe, they were putting academic scientists' names on the papers, um, even though they weren't written by those academic scientists. How can they do that? I mean, how can you put a name on a paper you didn't write? That's a decision that was made by those scientists. So, 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 what, so, what, what, what should we take? What should the public take from this? I mean, I mean, is it that we should not be eating oatmeal? Is it that uh, more research has to be done to find the direct link? Uh, is this a, more about the kind of the, the nature of corporate America and what they're doing to hide facts from us as citizens, and how the FDA may or may not be complicit in all this? I mean, this seems to be really tangled. So we know that pesticides and herbicides really shouldn't be in children's food products, and there's a way to avoid that. And that's what we're emphasizing and asking companies to look at their supply chain and source from oats that don't use harvest glyphosate applications. I mean, the, the, the list of products that you tested are things that we may use every day, not just oatmeal. We're talking about health bars, things that you buy that are seemingly organic off the, off the shelf like oatmeal health bars that people buy all the time. So I mean, so, so could you talk a bit about what, what you know about what's in those things that we buy beyond the oatmeal we eat, may, may or may not eat in the morning? So the fact remains that those oats are still nutritionally beneficial and will tend to be a healthy food. They just really shouldn't come with an extra sort of serving of herbicide or glyphosate, especially. <laughs> and, if it's something that somebody's concerned about, we really want them to reach out to their favorite brands and express their concern and say that they don't want these herbicides in their foods, especially the ones they're giving to their kids. So I'm thinking about what might have been before the rise of chemical giants in our agricultural world. And people have been eating oats throughout Europe since, since the beginning of farming. But there's a difference here, because if you use glyphosate, it's to speed up the crop itself so it withers so you can harvest it for cereal and other things you may consume, right? Yes. So, so, so talk a bit about that. I mean, so, so what is it? I mean, this is a, a relatively new phenomenon in terms of, of our food consumption. So are we suggesting that this should not, that glyphosate should be banned? We're really looking at this source of exposure for glyphosate. It's a small percentage of overall use, but can have high dietary levels for the average American and for children. So we're focusing on this use, this effect, and asking really companies to just work with their farmers a little bit. So would you, um... So talk a bit about what the effect may or not be on children. I mean, because it seems it's different if you do the studies and you look at a 150 pound adult um, consuming these products is different than having a child consume these products or, or having these products consumed with a woman who's carrying a child. What, what do we know about that? We know that children and pregnant women are both more susceptible to the health effects of exposure to chemicals, especially carcinogens. So that's why our value and our estimate looks at children's health as the most vulnerable endpoint. So what are, the, what are your next steps in the environmental working group with this study? 
really working with companies and asking you know companies to be transparent about where they're sourcing their oats from and making statement about trying to reduce the levels of glyphosate and pre-harvest glyphosate use for their oat products. <laughs> you think you're going to have some luck with Monsanto being open about uh, what they're actually doing? Yeah, we're definitely going to work with companies and you know pressure them to not have these products filled with glyphosate and. Again, you know, pesticides just really don't belong in children's food, and that's what we're working to help reduce. So I really do appreciate you taking the time with us today. This has been really interesting, Alexis Hemkin. And what we're doing is we're going to attach this article to our story here so you all can read it from the Environmental Working Group. Uh, and Alexis, thank you so much for your time today. We deeply appreciate it and really appreciate the work you all do with the Environmental Working Group. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Take care. You too. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being with us. Take care.